What's up everybody, Jared here with CarBuzz.com and today I am bringing you a very special review of the 2023 Aston Martin Vantage Roadster. So the Vantage name dates back all the way to the 1970s. Aston revived it in 2005 with what I think is one of the prettiest sports cars ever made. That model lasted over a decade and has been replaced with this, the current Vantage, which debuted as a coupe in 2018. They later added this Roadster convertible model, which I am testing for the 2023 model year to see if Aston has made any improvements to the formula. Let's start with the styling because that is something that is obviously important on an Aston Martin sports car. And to be honest, there was nowhere to go but down for this current Vantage because the previous model, like I stated, I think is one of the prettiest sports cars ever made. So it's gonna be hard to top that. Has Aston done a good job? I'm gonna leave that up to you, but let's go ahead and talk about the styling. You've got these really small headlights here on the Vantage and they look especially small given that there is so much frontal area and this car is so wide. I actually parked this next to my Porsche Boxster and it looked massive. You can just tell from this angle how wide and low this front end looks. It's almost like a slippery fish sort of thing. I see lots of elements of Dodge Viper, of Mercedes AMG GT, and I see a little bit of NB Miata in there, although I'm sure Aston probably wouldn't love that comparison, but that's what I see, especially with the headlights. Now the grille is also somewhat controversial because this car debuted with a titanium mesh grille that was supposed to harken back to, uh, what was it, The not the 177, one of their, cra the Vulcan, their crazy Vulcan prototype race car-y thing. And people did not like how that mesh grill looked because it looked a little bit unfinished, a little bit too much like a race car. So they introduced this, this vein grill, which debuted with this Roadster model. Honestly, I don't know if I'm a huge fan of it either. You can get it in all black. I'll show a picture of what it looks like on the configurator, the difference between the silver vein grill, the black vein grill, and that titanium mesh grill. And I wanna hear from you which one you think is best. But honestly, I think the vein grill is better, but you have to get it in black. I'm not a big fan of this silver one. Our test car is riding on optional 21 inch wheels. They cost $4,800, so you gotta be sure that you really like these. 20 inch wheels are what comes standard. This is a very customizable car, so be sure to check out the Aston Martin configurator to see which wheel option is your favorite. There are a lot of different options to choose from. Ditto for the color. It's sort of this dark red crimson color. I actually don't know the exact name of this color. It wasn't listed on my Monroney. It just said like dark red. Gorgeous color though. As you can see when we get up close to it, it really pops in the sun with a ton of metal flake. But then when it is not in the sun, it has this much darker look to it, this very dark burgundy look. Uh, so I really love the color. I just think that maybe with a black grill and, a, and black wheels that the overall look of this car would be a little bit better. The proportions are a little bit deceptive. It's really not that long overall of a car, but it, it's pretty long for a two-seater, to be honest. We've got the fabric soft top. You can also get the Vantage as a coupe. I'm actually going to be reviewing a coupe in just a couple of weeks, so stay tuned for that. But Aston claims that this is the fastest retractable soft top in the business. We're gonna go ahead and check that out a little bit later. We've got our door handles here that pop out manually. You have to kind of poke it and prod it to get it open, and then you can go ahead and lock it by pushing it this way. So I do actually like how that uh, door handle is integrated in there. It's easy enough to use. And then moving around to the back, we've got a very aggressive diffuser down here. Look at these like fins down here that are finished in body color with a little bit of black. You have those gorgeous quad exhaust pipes. Those look the business. And we've got this very interesting wrap around taillight bar that kind of bumps up here in the middle, the same as it does on the coupe. These are the clear taillights. You can actually get a red taillight option. Honestly, I love how the clears look with this red color. I think if you would have went with the red, 
it would be too much red. So it really just depends on which color you get, whether or not you should opt for the clear or the red tail light. Now that we've taken a look at the styling, let's see if the Vantage Roadster is practical. It might not be the first thing you consider when shopping for a sports car, but maybe you and your significant other want to take a road trip somewhere. You're gonna wanna bring bags and clothes, right? So the Vantage Roadster is gonna have less space than the coupe. The coupe has sort of a hatchback with like a uh, tiered shelving system that I do really like and I will be reviewing that in just a few weeks as a reminder. But I gotta say the trunk space in here is not terrible. It is a very wide opening here. It's obviously not that deep. Luckily, the folding soft top does not take up any space in here, so you can have the top up or down and it's not going to harm the trunk space. Annoyingly though, there is no button back here, at least none that I can find. Maybe you can let me know I'm wrong in the comment section. There is no button back here to open the trunk. You have to either do it on the key fob or on the door. You do at least get this nice leather handle with which to close the trunk and you gotta make sure you slam it. I've closed it gingerly a few times and then it's thought the trunk was open and I couldn't drive off. So before we check out the interior, I mentioned that Aston has the fastest convertible top in the business and you can put it up and down using the Aston Martin key fob. You just hit unlock and then hold the unlock button and the top will go down. It goes down in just 6.7 seconds. Let's go ahead and watch it and it's all the way down. Yes, that was really quick, and then the windows would go up if I keep holding the button, and then if I want to go ahead and close it on the key, I just hit the lock button, and then I hold that button, and the roof goes up in about 6.8 seconds. This can be done at speeds of up to 31 miles per hour as well. Wow, that is a really, really quick roof. I'm glad Aston Martin didn't go with a complicated retractable hardtop. Everything that we've covered up until now has been pretty hunky-dory, but now we're going to see where the Vantage maybe struggles a little bit here on the interior department. The interior looks nice and it is well appointed, especially the way that this car is spec'd out. We've got the sport seat plus, uh, so a sport seat comes standard. This is an optional seat that has a little bit more bolstering, a little bit more shape to it. You can see the base seat on the configurator. It is really a base seat. I don't know why you wouldn't want to upgrade to these. These seats are actually really good. They're really comfortable. We've got some optional stitching and stuff here. So we've got this beautiful red stitching here. We've got the Aston Martin logo stitched in red as well. We've also got these really cool perforations that are in kind of a cool shape. And optionally, we have heated and ventilated seats here. Uh, they work pretty darn well as well. There are a ton of different color and trim combinations that you can do here. This car is completely custom. So if you want to do blue and yellow or green and orange or whatever, you can pretty much do whatever you want here. You can get leather, Alcantara, whatever you want. You can even change the color of the seat belts. As you can see here, we have red seat belts as well. So nothing to complain about there. We also have leather everywhere in this cabin. We have an extended leather package on our tester. As you can see, more matching red stitching. We do have a ton of storage here in this armrest area on the door pocket. So it is a very deep door pocket that you can get a lot of stuff into. This is where we have our convertible adjustment if you're not doing it from the key fob, which I think is actually a rather convenient place for it. You can just kind of reach your left hand over and grab that. You don't have to do any crazy contorting to get into the center console. So all good so far, but now I'm gonna go ahead and step on in and we're gonna start getting into some of the weird ergonomic decisions that Aston Martin made with this car. Starting with the engine stop start, if I put my foot on it, it's gonna go ahead and glow in red. That's similar to other Aston Martin models. I'm gonna go ahead and push it. You get a slight delay before the engine starts. It's definitely designed to do that. There's nothing wrong with the car. I'm just not sure why they decided to do it that way. And now we can start to talk about some of the weird things here. I mean, first of all, the push button shifter, it's always been a little bit weird with Aston Martins, although I don't hate the way that this one is integrated because the buttons are very close. You can very easily hit park and drive with just one hand. You have your start button here in the middle. So it is a little bit better than some of the other Aston Martins I've driven where it's up here on the console and the drive button is kind of far away over on the passenger side. We gotta talk about the steering wheel because it's not really a wheel, it's more of a steering square, as you can see. I haven't had too much problem with it. It, it does 
operate naturally like a wheel. It's not like a Tesla yoke or anything too crazy like that, but it is kind of a weird shape that takes a little bit of getting used to. What doesn't take a lot of getting used to are these beautiful paddle shifters. You can just pull one to get into a manual mode. They are beautifully made. They are nice and metal and they feel great to use. You do also have two buttons here. This one labeled S right here is going to allow you to cycle through your different drive modes. So we have Sport is our default on this car, Sport Plus, and then we have a track mode that's going to adjust the engine uh, transmission and all of that. And then separately, we have a trans, uh, uh, sorry, a suspension button here for our adaptive dampers. We have the same settings, Sport, Sport Plus and Track. So you can adjust everything about the car except the suspension, and then you can tell the suspension what mode to be in. Honestly, as we're gonna find out, it's pretty firm, so I happen to like leaving it into its regular sport mode. You can see that uh, we do have digital gauges here. Aston Martin's beautiful metallic gauges from the previous generation Vantage are gone. They haven't used those in a while now. It's decently easy to control what is on this right screen here. Uh, you have a little home button here, and then you can cycle through trip, navigation, radio, media, telephone. Um, so it's not super hard uh, to use that. And as you saw that the gauges shift a little bit as you cycle through the modes. But the thing that's very weak on here on the Vantage is this infotainment system. As you can see, this screen is tiny. It's only an eight inch display. It looks like something that belongs in a Toyota Corolla, not a $200,000 sports car. It's glare filled, as you can see. We're not even like in the sun. I have the roof up still. And as you can see, it is very difficult to read what is on this screen, especially with the roof down. It has been completely blind and I've not been able to see what is on this screen. Aston Martin did put a sort of matte finish on this, which is supposed to help with glare, but as you could clearly see, doesn't work at all. You'd think that uh, Aston Martin would test this with the roof down, uh, but I guess because they test cars in Britain where there's never any sunlight, this is the end result of that. The switch gear in here doesn't feel particularly premium. We do have just kind of regular buttons. They have sort of an intuitive layout, except for like a few things. These are our dome lights down here to turn on and off the dome lights. Our lock and unlock buttons are split by the climate control. But I do like at least that there are physical buttons for everything. Everything is just one button away. You wanna pull up the navigation system, it's one button away. Your phone is one button away, but <laughs> the actual integration of this infotainment is not great. This is now a two or even three, depending on how you count Mercedes infotainment systems. Uh, Mercedes infotainment system from years ago, I believe you'd see something very similar on like a 20, 14 C-Class, so it is just feeling rather long in the tooth. You have this rotating controller. You do have wireless Apple CarPlay that I don't think used to be an option on the Vantage, but unfortunately I've had some trouble connecting mine. It pulls up Apple CarPlay and maps work, but there's no audio coming from it, so it doesn't take over the system the way that it's supposed to. I don't know if that's an issue with my car. I will test this again in the Vantage F1 Coupe that I'm getting in a couple weeks, and I will report back to you. Um, other than that, in terms of storage space, I already mentioned we have very, very deep pockets here on either side of the door that's good when you have a limited cabin space like what we have here in the Vantage. No glove box in the traditional sense. We do have these tiny cup holders here that are not great. As you can see, my big Yeti does not fit in there very well. We've got this little armrest with um, where our USB to use CarPlay if you want to use a wired connection for that. And then since we don't have a glove box, we do have a little storage area back here behind the seats. Now we get into the fun stuff to talk about, the engine. So Aston Martin has a partnership with Mercedes AMG to supply engines, and that's what we have here. It's the Mercedes AMG 4 liter twin turbocharged V8. You can tell that it's twin turbo because there are the turbochargers living right there in the bowels of the V, limiting the turbo lag and improving the responsiveness. You can see that under this gorgeous, massive clamshell hood that the engine pretty much sits behind the front axle line. So this is technically a mid-engine car. It is a front mid-engine car. Now the engine is built in Germany, it's a Mercedes engine, but as you can see from this handy plaque, it is hand built and final inspected in Great Britain by Pedro Costa. So I guess maybe some final assembly is done in Britain. Maybe certain parts of the engine are assembled there in Britain. 
Good numbers, 503 horsepower, 505 pound-feet of torque, going out to an eight-speed automatic. Though as we get it out on the road, you'll find that this is not the only engine option in the Vantage. All right, so now that we're done talking about all of the boring nitty-gritty stuff, let's get the Vantage Roadster out on the road and find out if this really feels like a two hundred thousand dollar driving experience now that is a tough thing to achieve but aston martin is known for building some of my favorite driver's cars so let's go ahead and put the the drive mode into track the most aggressive setting we're going to go ahead and put the suspension into track mode as well and then we're going to go ahead and do a race start i'm going to leave the convertible top up for this portion of the review it's very hot out right now in Florida, and that's just gonna give you better audio for this review. So let's go ahead and see how it gets off the line. Ready? Ooh. Woo! Oh, that sounds great. Listen to that V8, oh, the crackles. I'm gonna switch to manual mode. Oh, it farts! Oh, it backfires on the lift. <laughs> it makes some silly noises. Now that is Aston Martin's specific tuning of this AMG motor. This might be a German engine, but I'm telling you, it does sound a little bit different when the Brits get their hands on it. It's got just a more like a wail to it. It doesn't have that low gurgle that it has when it's in an AMG car. It does sound distinctly, distinctly different. So that launch was not the harshest thing I've ever felt. This is an eight speed automatic transmission rather than a dual clutch or the nine speed MCT multi clutch system that you get in the Mercedes AMG SL, and you actually get it in the Aston Martin DBX 707. Zero to 60 in this Roadster model takes 3.7 seconds, which is honestly, I think fast enough, but it doesn't feel, whoa, like Savage pin you off the line. It eases you into it, gains traction, and then it gives you full power. So we'll do it one more time. Restart, slowly, there we go. Oh, then we get the power. Oh, 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 it will handle the one two shift for you, but then as you might have heard, I'm an idiot and left it in manual mode, and then it doesn't handle uh, the two three shift for you. But yeah, zero to 60 in 3.7 seconds. If you keep going on, you'll hit 190 miles an hour, which is uh, pretty fun to do with, the, with a roofless car such as this. If you do want an even quicker Aston Martin Vantage, there are two options available for you. There is the F1 edition that I have mentioned in this review. It's gonna use this same engine tuned to produce 527 horsepower. It's gonna reduce your zero to 60 time to 3.6 seconds, so a little bit quicker there, and it is going to reconfigure this transmission to make it a little bit more savage and a little bit less comfortable. Now there is also the V12 Vantage. I was hoping and praying that Aston Martin would bring that model back because the previous generation V12 Vantage was just one of my favorite sports cars. It was gorgeous, it sounded glorious, and I love Aston Martin's 5.2 liter twin turbocharged V12 that they put in the DB11 and the DBS Superleggera. So that engine in this tiny little car has to be absolutely hilarious, and I hope I get a chance to drive that. It's gonna dial the horsepower up to 690 horsepower. So almost 200 horsepower more than you get from the standard Vantage Roadster. Zero to 60, 3.4 seconds. So it's really only three tenths of a second that you're getting for having four extra cylinders out of the engine and almost 200 extra horsepower. But I'm telling you that V12 engine note is going to be worth it. Not that this V8 doesn't sound great, but you can't beat a V12. Now I'm gonna slow things down a bit to talk about what it's like to live with the Vantage. And for that, I know it's a hot day, but I might as well put down the convertible top here and really enjoy this Florida weather that we've got going here. 
Now the ride comfort is definitely on the firm side. It is much firmer than a GT car like the DB11. So if you're planning on taking this on a lot of long road trips, I definitely suggest looking at the DB11 convertible instead of the Vantage. This is more of a back road sports car. That is more of a grand tourer. As evidenced by the drive modes, the fact that you don't have a GT mode like you get in the DB11, sport mode is your default. Now in sport mode, the car is a little lazy to respond. I'm gonna go ahead and floor it. it. Takes a little bit of time for the transmission to respond. Of course, you can just pull the paddles if you want a quicker response. And even with the adaptive dampers in their base sport setting, this is still a firm ride. <laughs> I honestly don't take it out of the sport suspension mode very often and put it into sport plus or track mode very often because these roads that I'm on are not great. And in track mode, I am really, I'm really bouncing around a lot. So honestly, whether I'm in sport, sport plus or track on the drive mode, I, I usually almost always leave the suspension mode on its base sport setting. The Sport Plus setting gonna give us much more access to that V8 engine. I go ahead and floor it. You can see much quicker responsiveness there. And then obviously things get even more aggressive when you put it into track mode. So now when I put it into track mode, it's going to default to the manual mode so that I have max power when I want it. Oh, you can tell. Oh, did you hear that? That was like a gunshot. Oh, God, for a country that doesn't allow you really to own a firearm, Aston really loves the sound of a gunshot. <laughs> I can quickly exit the manual mode if I need to. I just pull the upshift paddle and hold it there. That's going to go ahead and put me back into my drive setting here. Pretty easy. And then I'm going to go ahead and take it out of its crazy track mode. We do have a little bit more weight here on the Roadster. It's 132 pounds heavier than the Coupe, so it's 3,800 pounds total rear wheel drive. So it is a little bit different than the Mercedes AMG SL in that respect. The SL has gone all wheel drive only. It is significantly heavier than this as well. This is again, more of a sports car. The SL is more of a Grand Tourer if you are looking to compare those two because they do have the same engine. Uh, obviously, the Mercedes has a much nicer, more tech-filled interior, but I think that this is a little bit more fun to drive. So I put it into Sport Plus, which is kind of my favorite balance of all of the modes. Track mode's a little bit too extreme. I'm going through a corner here. Great bite on the brakes. Steering has so much feedback. Oh, Aston Martin knows how to do some good steering, don't they? Oh, the engine sounds great, especially with the top down. Again, those brakes are great. Manual shifting. You can take control whenever you want. Oh, I love that they haven't bothered with all-wheel drive. Keep that weight down. Rear-wheel drive is better. Oh, you can get that back out to slip just a little bit, but without being too terrified. I bet you that V12 one. Oh, is a bit of a handful. Oh my gosh. This is a great little sports car. Now let's go one step further. Track mode, engaged. Oh, there we go. Now it's even louder. Traction control's dialed back just a little bit more. Oh, God, that noise. Steering again. Oh, just so much feel through it. Easy on the brakes. This car does feel easy to point. It's small. And then that acceleration. Oh, good brakes. And I'm just enjoying this so much more with the roof down, all the noise, all the sun, all the sound. Oh, and those gunshots. <laughs> you do pay a price with fuel economy. You're gonna get like 18 in the city, 24 on the highway, 20 combined. I don't know where they got those numbers because I'm averaging 11 miles per gallon, but Big smile on my face. <laughs> this is not a logical purchase. You don't buy an Aston Martin Vantage Roadster because it makes the most sense on paper. You buy it because it makes you smile. <laughs> and this car makes me smile. I will say, if you want my full and honest opinion 
The Vantage is not my favorite Aston Martin. I believe that the DBS with its V12 engine and its improved comfort is still the one that I recommend. But the last one of those I tested was like $380,000. So for under 200, you're getting a lot of the same experience here. You don't get the back seat. Back seat's kind of useless anyway. But I also love that DBX. And I know that may sound blasphemous to say that an SUV could be as good as a sports car like this, but Aston Martin really did pack all of its DNA into the DBS, DBX, especially the 707 model. So you get a lot of what you get here. You get the same engine, even more power, more usability with an all wheel drive system. And you can take your entire family with you while you drive it. So if you got your eyes set on an Aston Martin Vantage, but you need something that you can drive every day, <laughs> go back and watch my DBX 707 video because that thing is just such an amazing experience. And now having completed my drive of every single Aston Martin in the lineup, this is the last one that I hadn't driven. <laughs> I know that was kind of a fun sentence to say. I don't think this is my favorite, but boy oh boy, if you can live with some of the practicality hindrances, it's a great experience. All right, so that was the 2023 Aston Martin Vantage Roadster. Let me know what you think of it in the comments. Would you buy this over a Porsche 911 or is there another sports car that has your eye? Of course, this is sports cars. You know, you're not gonna measure things like trunk space and technology and whatever. It's all going to be a personal decision based on how they look, how they drive and how they make you feel. That's the important part, really. So what is a price tag? <laughs> Let's talk about it because this car can make you feel all the fuzzy things you, you want, but you do have to be able to afford it. The starting price of a Vantage Roadster is just under $160,000. That is one six zero, about $16,000 more than the coupe variant. So you gotta love this car as a Roadster. You gotta wanna use the car with the roof down or else you're probably better off going with the lighter coupe version. This model that we've tested is about $198,000 with all of the available options, including a $3,086 destination fee. I can tell you that some of these options are definitely worth getting. You're gonna want the Aston Martin Premium Audio for $2,300. You're gonna want those ventilated seats for $1,100, especially if you live somewhere hot. This signature metallic paint is $4,400. I think it looks gorgeous, but maybe there is a cheaper paint option that you prefer. That optional veined grill up front, that's $2,900. So you really gotta make sure that you prefer that veined grill over the titanium mesh because that is quite a pricey option. And then we've got a bunch of other exterior packets, rear diffuser in body color, red seatbelt, 700 bucks, dark chrome jewelry pack, $1,800, contrast stitching, $1,900. As you can see, it really, really adds up to almost 200 grand. This is a really expensive car. It is. Obviously not perfect. I don't think it's as pretty as the previous generation Vantage, although it drives extremely well. This is a great experience. It sounds fantastic. And the looks, I'll leave that up to you, but I have been getting stares everywhere I go in this car, and you probably will too if you buy one. I really hope you've enjoyed this look at the 2023 Aston Martin Vantage Roadster. Be sure to tune back in for my review of the 2023 Aston Martin Vantage F1 Coupe, which should be very different from this car. As always, if you enjoyed, please leave a like, subscribe to our channel, and ring that notification bell to be alerted of our latest videos. I'll see you next time.